What Quebec and the rest of Canada doesn't realize, they have a common enemy, and the enemy is not themselves and each other. The enemy is, is, is America. In 1904, Prime Minister Wilfrid Laurier looked ahead and said, I think that we can claim that it is Canada that shall fill the 20th century. These words have been passed down in popular memory as, the 20th century belongs to Canada. With all that promise, why does it seem as though the revised slogan should be, in the 21st century, Canada belongs to the United States? This isn't always obvious at first glance. Marketing campaigns like to play up the Canadian image. The Tim Hortons coffee chain might be a Canadian icon, but the owners have been American for some time now. We're told that Canada's Molson's Brewery is only merging with Coors until it finally comes out that the two top jobs will be held by Coors executives and the head office will be in Colorado. Some people might call that a takeover. Even the slogan, I am Canadian, is gone. Too bad, it's good marketing. Canada, the brand. As the new Imperium strides the world, Canada isn't the only country threatened by its massive weight. But we are special. We have experience. Canadians have been resisting Americanization for over 400 years. The question is, have we still got the will our ancestors had? The first attempts to take over Canada were military, and early on they were part of a wider hostility between Britain and France. The country known as Canada was a French colony, and the British occupied the 13 colonies in what is now the eastern seaboard of the United States. But right from the start, the Anglo-American colonists wanted the whole continent for themselves. Champlain had barely got his settlement going in Port-Royal when the governor of Virginia hired a band of mercenaries to attack in 1613. Then before that century was out, two more invasions were sent north in 1690. When William Phipps anchored in the St. Lawrence, beneath the walls of Quebec City, sent a messenger to seek Quebec's surrender, Governor Frontenac famously replied, Dites à votre général que je lui répondrai par la bouche de mes canons. Which he did. And together with our natural ally, the encroaching winter, sent Phipps back to Boston minus one flag. These attacks kept up throughout the 1700s, until finally the North American conflict became part of a European war between France and England called the Seven Years' War, which began officially in 1756 and ended in 1763. Here in North America, the decisive battle came on the Plains of Abraham in 1759, when Montcalm left the walls of Quebec City against the advice of the Canadian-born governor, Vaudreuil, to fight a traditional European-style battle and was promptly defeated by Wolfe. The Quebec historian Guy Frego has said that the conquest of Canada was essentially an American idea and subsequent history seems to bear him out. The attacks continue. The British finally had to give their new colony a constitution, which they did in 1774 with the Quebec Act. The merchants of New England did not like the Quebec Act very much. In fact, they were enraged that the Ohio Valley, which they had in their expansionist sites, would remain part of Quebec's territory and that language, legal and religious rights would be granted to the French Catholics of Quebec, preventing the Americans from dominating what they had hoped would be a wider legislature. The Quebec Act became just one more of the intolerable acts which led the Americans to launch their war of independence from Britain or revolution, depending on how you look at it, in 1775. This included a long winter siege of Quebec by the infamous Benedict Arnold. A 
As part of the warm-up to that invasion, the Americans sent infiltrators ahead to spread the word that the Canadians were about to be conquered into liberty. We had a choice, their propaganda said, to have all the rest of North America your unalterable friends or your inveterate enemies. In the stripped-down lingo of the 21st century, you're either with us or against us. The Canadians declined the invitation. The final attempt to take Canada by force was the War of 1812. The Americans wanted the whole continent and saw no reason why they shouldn't have it. In fact, they thought it would be easy, a mere matter of marching, as Jefferson said. But despite being vastly outnumbered, the Canadians with their British and Indian allies used their wits and determination to push the Americans back. The heroes are well known in folk song and myth. Isaac Brock, Tecumseh, Laura Sikor, and the Salaberry. What we lacked in brute force, we made up for in tactics, and not only prevented the Americans from invading, but seized land in Michigan and northern Maine. This, of course, was given back in the Treaty of Ghent that ended the conflict, prompting Canadian journalist Bruce Hutchison to say that the United States had lost the war and won a conference. It wouldn't be the last time England sacrificed Canadian interests when it suited them. The sabers kept rattling throughout the 1800s, in the east during the Aroostook War and in the newly opening West. By 1844, an American president could get elected on the slogan 54-40, or fight. James Polk's elections promised to push the western border north to Alaska. It was around this time that the New York newspaper editor coined a new term to justify American continental ambitions. Manifest destiny. When neither law nor history favors your action, you'd better invoke God or providence to bolster your cause. And moving away from the armed approach, the cry for the 1840s was annexation, an option readily supported by our own big business class here in Montreal. This fifth column included such established names as Redpath and Molson, who signed the annexation manifesto, promoting it as a way of, among other things, increasing Canadian property values and opening up new markets. Rural Canada saw things differently, calling these annexationists mercenary traitors, prepared to sell their heritage for Yankee gold. 